Welcome to the JT Fox Podcast Network, and you are in for a treat here today because we are going to talk about someone who is completely innovating the idea of the restaurant concept because everybody thinks they can run a restaurant. Well, today we have someone from my hometown, Montreal, Canada, who literally built the restaurant empire in Dubai as well as London and here to give us exactly his story of being completely broke working for somebody else and then building a restaurant empire and getting down to the nitty gritties of what does it take to succeed, not just in a restaurant, but any business. Please welcome to the JT Fox Podcast Network, Mr. Joey Gazelle. Hey, Joey, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, it's 5 a.m. for London time for you, but it, you were worth it for me to do a podcast this early, by the way. I appreciate you. So, oh, so you're my Montreal homeboy. Yeah, well, you know, the... You ever wonder, Joey, how everybody thinks they can run a restaurant, right? So the idea is everybody thinks that, oh, if I started a restaurant or I can run a restaurant on a scale of one to 10, you know, as an entrepreneur, how hard is it to run a restaurant, a successful restaurant um, and why? Restaurant business is definitely one of the hardest businesses you can imagine because it's so intensely multidisciplinary. You have to be equally left brain and right brain at the same time. I mean, you need to know creativity and you have to have a love for cooking and for, you know, marketing and presentation and art and design. And at the same time, you need to be very strong in systems and procedures and accounting and corporate governance and in, in, in HR. And it's, it's, you never, you rarely find people that are equally good at both. So why is it most, what's the statistics on a restaurant that how long do they last? When did, like, is it three years? Is it five years? And why do they fail? Well, I would say uh, in the bar and nightclub space, typically they have about a two or three year lifespan, typically, uh, because you need to uh, constantly be ideating and you need to be constantly being creative on bringing people in. And it gets a little boring in the restaurant space. If you create something that is timeless and, you know, feels uh, familiar, uh, it can last 20, 30 years. Um, some people make the mistake of creating restaurants that feel a little bit like a fad in the moment. And, you know, they have a very strong, successful opening, but then it dies out for whatever reason, maybe mostly because, you know, the promise is not kept, the quality is not there, people are not recognized, they don't know how to... Um, loyalize their customers but in general if you create a restaurant that feels classic and timeless i feel like you can definitely make it last a very very long time give us an example of a restaurant off the top of your mind where you know the idea is it started off well it was very hot we may not know the name and why did it decline so we have an idea of a, of what a fail concept uh, is um, you want to give you a specific example? <laughs> yeah, or just maybe we may not know the name, but th this is what the, the the restaurant was about, and was packed, and, and and it was on fire, and then it just died. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, many times, you know, uh, again, being in this business, you see a lot of, for example, chefs, celebrity chefs. They write multiple cookbooks. You know, they're very famous. Um, and they want to open their own space. So they meet an investor. The investor throws a lot of money at the project. It's not designed to um, evoke, let's say, the chef's personality or the chef's food or the ethos of what the chef stands for. Um, it's over the top. It's designed, um, really feels like it was designed by a designer. They have a very expensive opening. They bring in, you know, the likes of, the Kim Kardashians of the world and so on. They spend, I don't know, hundreds of thousands and not millions of dollars on this crazy opening. But in the end, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. It doesn't matter what kind of big bang opening you've had. If the chef does not feel, and this is the celebrity chef, if the chef does not feel like the space represents him, if he's not invested, if it doesn't feel that it's an extension of him or of his work, um, if the client doesn't feel that it's familiar or comfortable or, um, you know, 
has an identity, I would say. Are, are you saying that the food is not good? Or, or is it, because I, I don't understand, right? If the food is good, like who cares about the identity or the feeling? Are you saying that the customer really resonates that and feels that? I mean, I, I you imagine know, having, this celebrity having, chef has... Having good food is not necessarily a given, you know, or excellent food. I mean, you have to have good quality food. But I would say that, you know, there are many restaurants that have average food and succeed because they have an amazing ambiance, because of an amazing experience, um, because maybe the pricing is right. I mean, there's a lot of places where, you know, they hit a certain target audience and they operate on volume, let's say. So it's, first of all, you have to know what kind of restaurant you're opening. Um, my example about the celebrity chef, his food was very much fusion based. People didn't understand it. It was something that he was he was playing with something that was meant to be honest and authentic and familiar to people. But what ended up happening was every dish that came out was a twist on a dish that didn't really need to be twisted. So that is where you lose people. You lose people when you are not able to give them something that they they recognize, they appreciate, they're looking for. That I, That's where I would say he failed. So let's go back to yours. We're both from Montreal, Canada. So obviously you have a very successful restaurant. I won't give the name yet so that we can go into the story. Um, but did you always knew that you'd like, this, when you were younger, like this is what I want to do. I want to be a restaurant. Because I was I a waiter and I have no interest. Yeah, uh, I mean, about... actually... <laughs> My my dad really wanted me to get into hospitality when I was young. And I said to him, hell no, I have no interest in getting into hospitality. He wanted me to go to hotel management school um, in Switzerland. He wanted me to, he was looking at Cornell uh, in Ithaca, New York. And I was just like, I had no interest in it because the idea of being uh, working in a hotel my entire life and maybe potentially becoming a general manager really didn't make any sense to me. But then what happened was at 17, he was like, look, uh, the money tap is being turned off. You need to go get a job. And what job are you going to get at 18 years old if it's not like a busboy in a restaurant? So I worked as a busboy in a very um, successful high-end restaurant in Montreal uh, called Cut Cheval, which was really one of these very high concept spaces. I mean, it was a steakhouse, big wines, big steaks, Lots of celebrity clients, you know, 400 seats on multiple floors. It was right in front of the Bell Center. So it was hockey nights in Canada. It was super busy, you know, uh, all the time. And it was an amazing school for me. And I I actually, at 18, 19, 20 years old, it brought me out of my shell. I learned how to, you know, talk to people. I learned how to sell product. I learned how to guide people in a perfect experience. I learned how to be a host. Um, I learned about you know networking i learned about uh working within a team i worked i learned about being under pressure i mean these are things that you want to learn when you're 18 19 years old so i think actually being a waiter is one of the best jobs you can do when you're young i, I agree when i was i mean i started off as a waiter and i always treated my section like my little business so it kind of helped me to entrepreneurism i had my four tables um but i also learned about the art of of a lot of drama. See, at the end of the day, I had all these tips and then I would go home and put them into my green lunchbox and I would count the money every single night that I made every night from any night. And the culture of a lot of waiters is they would take those tips and then go drinking after at another they bar. Blow the money on all kinds just, of stuff. Yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah they no. go blow the money. And so, and, and, and as a, that's why I wasn't too popular because they're like, oh, you know, you don't, you, you're not hanging out with us or stuff like that. But I was saving up money, which was a lot of money. It was cash money too. Yeah. It's a lot of money to be making also when you're that young. I remember I was making a thousand dollars a week cash and I thought I was like the king of the world. Um, and the funny thing is that I would take that money and I'll go blow it on really expensive dinners in other restaurants. That's what I would do. And actually, that's the irony of it all is I started to realize not only did I enjoy being in the business, but I also enjoyed going out there and observing and, you know, just taking stock of other restaurants and why it works and why it doesn't work and why I was connected and gravitated to these to these different places. And that kind of became my whole life. I mean, I think I spend now the majority of my life traveling, visiting restaurants. I don't go to every restaurant. I mean, I feel like certain things really attract me, 
But I'm able to sit down in a restaurant and I'm able to say, understand why I like it, why it works. I look around and I understand why it is the people, why it resonates with people. And I would say that that's kind of been the reason why I got into into restaurant development. And well, how did that happen? So you're you're a busboy waiter, and then how yeah, does I it... worked. I also did a stint in London where I worked with Soho House uh, at the first location on Greek Street in Soho. Um, which again was a, a foray into sort of the private members model and and, kind of and why there was there a strategic concept or was that was the job was, that was there are you being strategic about where you it was there it was just the job that was there there was no there was really no rhyme or reason I was just you know hey I can make money this way and and I became a manager uh, of a restaurant I became the general manager of a restaurant my big break really was in two thousand and four when I became the head of marketing and development for a big restaurant company. Um, and working very closely with the owner, we were developing about, I don't know, two restaurants a year at one point. So, and we were designing everything in house, doing all the marketing, we were doing all the pre-openings, all the development. And I really got to see firsthand the process of really what it means to not only create a concept, but to build a company and to build a culture. And also I learned a lot of what to do and also what not to do. So you do that, and then how do you start your own restaurant? Well, I mean, it wasn't planned. I When I turned 30, um, it was a little bit after 2008. So, when, you know, the market after the crash was not great uh, in Canada. Um, you know, the cracks started to show. And I was saying to myself, I really like... I, I started mentally preparing myself for opening my own restaurant. Um, my father got diagnosed with cancer, so I had to move to Beirut um, to spend really the last six months with him before he passed away. Um, and uh, and while I was there, someone approached me and said, "Why don't you stay in in Beirut?" And, and you know, I have this idea. I've got some money. Uh, I'm looking to open a restaurant. What would you do? And that's really how it started. People. Uh, started sort of chasing me to help them develop restaurants. Um, they were asking me what uh, I wanted to do. I had to start thinking about what I wanted to do. So when my father passed away, I have to say that one of the ways that I dealt with his passing was I really launched myself into opening restaurants. And I opened five restaurants in two and a half years in Beirut. Wow. And yeah. And uh that's also not the way you do things, I have to say. Right. And, and I, how, how is it like to do business in Beirut? Obviously, we see what happens in the news and, and how, mean, what kind of restaurants. And is it? Is... First of all, Beirut is, 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 again, not what you see on the news. Beirut is an extremely vibrant. Um, it's one of the one of the uh, it's a vibrant city. It's got one of the most interesting design and culinary. Um, you know, uh, it's one of the most interesting culinary destinations in the world, I would say. It has some of the most interesting um, bars and nightlife concepts that you, people love to, to dine out and they love to party. So it was a it was great and it was a great time in Beirut um, back then in 2010, 2011, uh, before the Syrian war. And I have to say, I had a really, really good time there when I was there. But to your point, it's a very different culture. I'd never lived there before, um, even though I'm I'm uh, originally Lebanese, I, I'd never in my entire life spent any time there. Really. What's the difference between the Canadian culture, which I know, versus the the Lebanese culture? I mean, first of all, the thing you need to understand about Lebanon is there's 18 different religions in one country. Okay, um, you know, and it's quite tribal, so not everybody gets along entirely. You know, they had a they had an 18 year civil war. Um, they there's a lot of it's it's again it's a beautiful country they you know people can agree on 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 the way of life is amazing but i think within work culture it's quite uh segmented and quite tribal so it's actually quite difficult to to you know for me to do business there. the other thing i would say is that the city is always changing so areas that are hot one moment literally die after about a year or two and they literally shift the area to another area so it's quite difficult. I think people who do business in Lebanon um, are have a vi very much a survivalist mentality. You know, if they've lived there their whole life, they know how to just pick up and start again quite quickly. And me coming from Canada, 
um, I think I probably struggled because, you know, I, I was doing business plans, like five-year projections. I was looking at 10-year projections. I wanted like, you know, stable, a stable environment. And um, at that time, that was not it. And so these five concepts, are you owners in these concepts and what Correct. happened to them? Correct. So at the beginning, when I was, when I was uh, being approached, um, people would offer me, at the beginning, they would offer me just to sort of develop the concepts for them. Um, and then what I would do is I'd sort of hash out my ideas and kind of a deck of what I thought would work. Um, I would help them put it together. I would help them source the chefs. I would help them do the designs. I would help them kind of really hash out what they wanted to do. But in the process, I also started to take sweat equity in the businesses instead of actually taking fees. Uh, that was my first uh, restaurant that I did. But with time, I started to get more confident. And when those concepts started succeeding, people started offering me more percentages, or I was able to get sweat equity and a fee. Um, I was able to get sweat equity with options to buy more equity. Um, I started to be able to do many, many kind of things in my early restaurants. Um, but really, for me, it was just about trying things out, learning, building a resume, building a reputation, you know, starting to really kind of understand. And I was doing smaller restaurants. I mean, I, the first one I did was really a burger shop. It was sort of the beginning of that craze of the gourmet burger. So we had two burgers and a hot dog, but it was like the best quality burger you could have. Um, we had a celebrity chef attached to it. Uh, it was as simple as hell, but actually it was so wildly successful that because of that, people started knocking on your door and everybody wants to do something. So it started to um, it started to take life. And what I realized is that it's all a process. I mean, at the end of the day, as long as you're building a good reputation, as long as you have a strong track record, as long as you're networking, as long as you can prove your commitment and quality and so on, you know, the projects just get more interesting and bigger and better. What did you realize did not work and what really worked? If you like break it down in, in Lebanon at that time, you're like, this really works if I do this. This doesn't work. Um, I would say when at that time, you know, I had, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. I had created a, a steakhouse um, and it was on the bay surrounded by luxury yachts. And for every, for every intents and purposes, it should have, worked but the problem with it was that it was i was designing a very high-end steakhouse in a location that had no direct access by car you had to kind of park with the valet and then you had to walk a bit and 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 you know take some stairs to arrive at the location and what i realized did not work is having a disjointed sense of arrival so even though it was in this magical location and even though it was the view was amazing of all these luxury yachts. And even though the product was amazing and the, you know, the service was excellent and the place was beautiful. If there's no sense of arrival to match the uh, let's say the, the elevated experience that you're offering, that doesn't work. I think, I think it all starts with the arrival. Like the ambiance or just the ease of it oh, or just the, the, coming out of your car you know, giving your keys to a valet and walking directly into a restaurant, not having to take an elevator, not having to take stairs, not walking into a hotel lobby, not walking into a mall. The sense of arrival is probably one of the key ingredients in my mind um, to start your, you know, journey of a good of a good restaurant. Isn't that ironic though, the restaurant that I went to and maybe we'll see Dubai that I had to walk into a hotel lobby, not sure where I'm going. And then the door was there. So it was a little hard for me to get to Dubai to, to get to that restaurant. So let's get how to did you, How did it make you feel? Well, I just, I didn't want to be late. So, I was, and I walked, which was the only guy who walked in Dubai to the restaurant from my hotel. Um, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I think, I, I think I was a little like, where is it trying to like it was the signage there wasn't as obvious interesting as... because my my first restaurant in dubai actually i opened it in a um hotel uh, garage literally you had to drive into the garage 
to access the restaurant. And it was sandwiched between the garbage room and the delivery dock of the hotel where all the deliveries, the fish and the meat were being delivered. And when the location was presented to me, I absolutely fell in love with it. I remember the the agent that was showing it to me was kind of shy to show it to me because she couldn't see what I saw. And actually what I saw was this completely hidden, discreet entrance. And I had this feeling that when people would find it and would walk through the doors, it would create this sort of false expectation. I had a feeling that people would really connect with that sort of speakeasy-esque kind of arrival. Because to your point, at that time in Dubai, every restaurant is in a mall or in a hotel lobby, so on. But if you're able to just drive into this garage and then you're with guests and your guests say, where are you taking me? And they say, don't worry, I'm going to take you to this amazing place. And you arrive at this completely unassuming place. It's literally so industrial and feels so wrong. And you walk through those doors and then you're met with beautiful interiors and vibes and ambience. You're, that's the kind of the 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 attachment I wanted people to have to the place. But isn't that a risk though? Like I did on a day be like just kind of like the yacht place where you have to go to the stairs and and it's it's unassuming and it, you talk about the the arrival in a in a parking lot garage with the container with the garbage containers. Like wasn't that yeah, a you risk? would think it wouldn't work, but I don't know why I absolutely felt that it would because I think I had a sense of what was going on in Dubai at the time. And what was really missing was something that felt very honest and discreet and very uh, not flashy, you know? Um, I feel that when you open up a restaurant that you have to access through a hotel lobby, it doesn't really feel authentic enough. And so I was really wanting to create something that felt gritty and authentic and real. And actually that opening up in that garage, I think really achieved that. Well, let's go back. When did you decide to go to Dubai and why Dubai? Right. So um, I left Beirut in 2013. Um, I, I sold out of my different restaurants. I closed one of them, um, made a little bit of money, and I decided to go to Dubai. I grew up in Dubai. You know, my father was in Dubai. My family was in Dubai from 1975. So I went to high school there. I'd gone to primary school there. I really saw Dubai before it became this crazy. No, but there was nothing in 75 in Dubai. It was like a nothing. sand. It... There was nothing. My father worked uh, as as um, station manager, KLM, and then general manager of Donata, uh, which is the passenger handling agent at the airport. And really, if you just look at the airport, the airport in, in the 70s was just a one-room airport. Now it's one of the busiest transit airports in the world. Dubai, when I was going to school there, my, my school was out in the desert. I felt like I had to travel for an hour into the desert to get to my high school. And now it's literally in the middle of a, of a city twice the size of Chicago. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, Dubai is one of these amazing stories where an entire city has literally been built in under 20 years. And if there's one thing I would say about growing up there, it, that I really appreciate about Dubai is that it kind of fills you with this amazing sense of limitlessness. I mean, ambition and, and, and drive. It's one of these, these amazing places. Did you feel that way when you came? I, I think Dubai reminds me of a Miami, a bit of on steroids. Right. Yeah, and Miami so I, I, I've come to realize and it, 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 you go to Dubai for lifestyle, but it's hard to do business in Dubai. It, it's like, it feels like it's not like I'm going to go in there and I'm going to need all these people to do business with them. I, I'm going to meet great people. I'm going to meet great relationships. Um, but it's not, it's not easy to do business in Dubai. First of all, um, I don't think it's easy to do business anywhere, but I think you definitely have to be invested in Dubai. You have to be spend time there. You have to, you have to really uh, commit yourself. And you can't just go in there and think you're going to make a quick buck. And, and which is uh, what a lot of people do, which is what a lot of people do. But that's what happens. People blow a lot of money. I mean, I, I can't tell you the amount of restaurateurs that, you know, try to open up in Dubai, the amount of celebrity chefs that have tried to open up in Dubai and have failed. Um, it's one of the highest number of restaurants per capita 
in the world. I think we're now at 13,000 restaurants. And it's it's an insanely competitive dining market. And when I opened the first restaurant in Dubai in 2015, in that hotel garage, it was really about my feeling that I had identified a real gap in the market. And I felt so confident about it. I looked around and I saw what was happening. And I'm like, this is what's missing. This feeling is what's missing. And I really, and I, and I went for it. And, and so what was the concept? What was the first concept? And this is the parking garage one. Correct. So um, I opened a restaurant called The Main, um, which was really meant to be an oyster bar and grill. You know, as a Montrealer, uh, as most Montrealers, I would spend almost every summer vacationing in on the East Coast, in Vermont and Maine and, and Massachusetts and so on. And as a kid, I remember feeling like lobster rolls and oysters and crab in the bucket and corn on the cob was just my like fondest memory of my childhood. And so I really just wanted to open up uh, a great seafood restaurant in this garage that kind of felt like it was a fishmonger that was converted into a restaurant. So a beautiful fish market, you know, a half a dozen selections of oysters, um, you know, all the things that you, that I remembered fondly as a child, you know, uh, clam chowder and like I said, crab cakes and lobster rolls and and I'm and I love oysters. It's one of those things that I I really love. So predominantly a seafood restaurant, but that also had a lot of other things that I knew would really work. You know, pasta dishes, uh, a great grill, uh, steaks and chops, um, and 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 really what it kind of became, it kind of became a love letter to all of the different experiences that I had at all these different restaurants around the world. Uh, at the in the early part of my career, that's what was the first one, and it was so successful that we ended up opening up three of them uh, in Dubai, and and now London. And uh, last summer was our first season. We had one in Ibiza as well. So let's go over the concept. So explain to people exactly what the concept because they're not all the same. They there's there's the called the main, but there's different themes of the main. Correct. Sure. So, I mean, look, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to create a kind of very classic American um, steakhouse at the, at the core, you know, seafood, steak. It's really a grill at the end of the day. So um, I wanted something that felt very familiar. I wanted something that felt that uh, there were, you know, there were food that you really wanted to eat. Uh, I wanted it to feel like a place you could come to multiple times a week that was kind of multi-occasional. You could dress it up and dress it down. You could come on a Monday night for a simple date night with your with your wife, uh, or you could come with your business partners and impress and, and have seafood towers and a tomahawk steak uh, on the weekend. So I wanted something that really felt like a community space. And the first one we'd open was in a very densely a populated area in Dubai that really had kind of like been largely unexplored before. But I understood that there was a really, really interesting encatchment of high, you know, uh, high income uh, couples that were looking for a place where they could go either to hang out at the bar or to have a dinner um, or somewhere that became kind of a an institution, I would say. Um, so that's what it is. It's a, it's, it's an American grill. Um I call it a brasserie. And at the time, I felt that that market sector of a brasserie, which is kind of, I would say, premium casual middle market, which was offering great value, uh, you know, great experience, great quality food, but a kind of an affordable price was completely missing. And what we ended up becoming by opening up three locations around the city was we kind of became the brasserie company of the city. So the concept that I went to the restaurant, the food was phenomenal. And there's this expectation in Dubai of like, how do you get the best food? Is it flown in from all over the world? And you were kind of shocked me about, about where the food actually comes from and how fresh it was. Yeah. I mean, look, the thing about Dubai is yes, there's a lot of things that are imported um, specifically in terms of steak and in terms of seafood, definitely our oysters are imported. We have one great guy uh, called Rami Murray who 
is the first to create an oyster farm in the UAE called Dibba Oysters. So we do also have a local oyster. But the thing that is very surprising that most people would not know is there's over 4,000 farms in the UAE. I mean, people think it's a desert, but actually they grow everything. You have strawberries, you have every type of lettuce and vegetable you can imagine. So actually our menu is 90% the vegetables are actually grown locally. Wow. And then you decide to foray in into the London market and open a, a time during COVID, one yeah. of your biggest now restaurant, uh, that one of, almost one of your most famous in London, very famous celebrities go there. You were just there yesterday telling me before the call, all the celebrities and all that. So you were to start the main concept into London what happened and tell us about what the story, which is a remarkable um, during COVID. Yeah, so look, we, we had an enormous amount of success with the main in Dubai. We had three locations and, you know, I was discussing uh, with my partners in about 2018, I said, look guys, if we want to be taken seriously in this space, we need to open up an international location. And London made the most sense because, like I said, I mean, I lived there, I've worked there. Um, it's very much a suburb of Dubai almost. I mean, I think there's an amazing kind of uh, interchange between London and Dubai. Um, and I started the process of looking at what kind of main would work in London. So I spent about two years looking at different locations, dining out at almost every possible restaurant you can imagine in the city to kind of identify what the gap in the market is. Um, and interestingly, uh, I'd even hired a company to do kind of a bit of a market study with focus groups. And, and we invest a lot of time and energy and money into the exercise because I didn't want anyone to, I also didn't want, I wanted to be able to put my hand on my heart and say, I really did my homework. And interestingly, <laughs> we had decided on a small location in the city at the time. Uh, the city being the banking sector, Liverpool Street. Um, and what ended up happening was, you know, we we paid the deposit on the rent, we did all the designs, we invested a lot of money, and then COVID happened. And we ended up not going ahead with that site. And walked how, away how, much were, how much were you into by then? About a half a million pounds. Just yeah. like that. Now, are you feeling the pressure? Because that's a lot of money, you know. I mean, I was feeling the pressure to go back to, you know, my investors and say, we're just walking away from this kind of sunken cost and we're not even going to do anything. And it's very interesting. I'd come to London in October 2020 in full lockdown. And I, the landlord from this location in the city was calling me like, are you going to start construction? Because they were allowing construction to happen at that time. And I'm just, I'm just saying to her, do you realize that the world has fallen off a cliff and there's a global pathogen out there and, and, and the city is completely unworkable right now. Um, and I had to make the very hard decision of walking away from that site. But interestingly, my agent at the time, uh, my real estate agent calls me up. He said, look, there's this other site in, Mayfair that is available, would you like to look at it? I said, it's Mayfair. It's, you know, much more expensive. It's, it was a much larger space. The investment was probably four times more than what we had planned to do in the city. Um, I said, I'll look at it. And I, I guess I'll talk to the guys and see what kind of deal we can arrive at. But I didn't, I thought it was a total long shot. I didn't really think that that would be a viable option. Also, I mean, again, we're talking October 2020. I mean, the work, the world has gone dark. Um, it was not the time to be opening a restaurant. I think most Which, restaurants. Let me step back. Your Dubai restaurant, October 2020, Dubai had somewhat opened up. Is there restrictions on restaurant? How well those restaurants are doing in October 2020? Honestly, I mean, knock on wood, I consider myself very lucky because Dubai really knew what they were doing. They went, they went immediately into lockdown for only two months. And then when they reopened, they opened with restrictions, with uh, capacity limitations. They were kind of riding the waves of the infections. And there was a lot of rules and systems in place. And everybody participated. I mean, they all understood that what they were doing was for the benefit of everyone to reopen 
and to maintain everyone's livelihood. Because let's be honest, a lot of people lost their shirts. And I feel very lucky that we opened, that we were able to reopen in June. I opened in June with a new restaurant, the one that you came to in Business Bay. Oh, wow. And actually, we still ended up, again, I've considered myself very blessed and lucky. We ended up even closing with a profit that year. Wow. And so, and that's all really all down to, I have to say, to the government and their understanding of the situation. And, it, it you know, it was, it was the, really the main reason why we were able to then do the London project and open up coming out of London lockdown in October, 2021. And, and you spent a lot of money on this. It described us this location, which is uh, now one of the biggest hotspots in London. Right. So the main Mayfair is located on Hanover Square uh, in Mayfair. Mayfair is one of these, you know, I think on the Monopoly board, it's the most expensive area. It is literally the most expensive real estate in the world. Um, it's where you could find, you know, the best restaurants, the highest number of Michelin star restaurants, private members clubs, and so on. Um, and where we're located is really the original square of Mayfair um, and was uh, very much under development for 10 years. So we took this location that was a Georgian townhouse, an 18th century Georgian townhouse that built in 1720, grade two listed, beautiful features inside. It had never been a restaurant before. Um, and Great Portland Estates, the landlord uh, and I were, were in talks for a very long time, uh, for about you know three to six months about what kind of restaurant would work within this kind of residential building almost. It's three floors five rooms it seats about 400 people um and each room is wildly different uh because you're, you're essentially building a restaurant in what used to be a home in a georgian home so it was a an amazing project to do it's the fastest project i i've ever done uh, i first saw the location in october 2020 with all the negotiations and the back and forth, we signed the lease in January 2021. With all the permitting and the designs, I was able to start construction in April 2021, and I opened in October 21. So, one year end to and end. and you spent how many pounds on on to just the restaurant itself? Over 12 million pounds. Yeah. Are you feeling the pressure at that point of like that's a lot of money? And how did you know that was going to work in a hyper competitive? market where there's so many different types of these restaurants in and around there? Well, the truth is that when I started to uh, feel that this project was going to happen, I went out to a lot of people that I trust uh, in Dubai, whose opinions I I value, and I, and I asked them, I said to them, hypothetically, I mean, I have this location. It's a dream location. It's a dream scenario. This doesn't happen every day. It's just by some kind of divine intervention that this thing is kind of landed in our lap would you think i was crazy if i jumped on this and every single person i spoke to said no said go for it because the world will reopen there'll be a huge amount of pent-up demand and if you open up in the right way you'll come out being that hot story when people have been locked in for a year or so what's the right way well, um, I would say, obviously, you have to be prepared. You know, you have to open up with uh, the right kind of narrative. You need to open up with a big bang. You need to do a series of of of, of openings. Almost, it's not just one opening. Uh, I think it's about in London, really opening in London uh, in a in a location like that, amongst that kind of competition and that. That uh, the caliber, I would say, of restaurants, you need to come out of the gates swinging. I mean, you know, at that point, you're in so deep. It's it's really just about creating the maximum noise, the maximum value, the maximum experience that you can, because, you know, for all intents and purposes, you're you're a new kid on the block, and I would say that would be that would be the right way. So I opened up with a lot of 
different kinds of events. I opened up with, you know, two PR agencies that I was working with at the time uh, to bring in almost two completely different kinds of clients. Um, we opened up with, uh, you know, a lot of reviews, a lot of invitees. Um, I opened up in a kind of a staggered approach. So I didn't open up the whole space in one shot. I went room by room. Um, and really we opened up with a maximum kind of virality, I would say. So, you know, it's a space, one of the rooms in the building does live jazz every single night and burlesque performances. So I understood that the beauty of that room and, and that dramatic chandelier and these burlesque performances and this cabaret feeling and this kind of, I would say, aesthetic or ambiance of the 1920s would be would become very Instagrammable and would become kind of a very hot ticket in town. And and I was right that it did it did become and it also cemented itself as kind of the go to destination whenever you're looking for a good night out for good value whenever you're coming into town or you you know you have friends in town that you want to impress our places is, is is that kind of place. And then how did you get to um, Ibiza? Ibiza actually was a funny story. So I you know I've always been very interested by. I mean, I've, I've been going to Ibiza for 20, 25 years. Um, and I've always been interested with sort of su summer seasonal destinations. And the reason for that is because traditionally in a restaurant, especially in Dubai, for example, July and August, most of our clients are in Ibiza, they're in Mykonos, they're in, you know, Sardinia, uh, they're in Saint-Tropez. And you got to go where your where your regulars are. And I knew that our regulars, the majority of them were in Ibiza. So opening in Ibiza has always been kind of an interesting model for me. Um, and again, serendipitously, somebody somebody had had messaged me in March last year and said, look, there's a location that's available. It used to be a restaurant about four years ago. It's already fully kitted up. Would you like to come and see it? Because, you know, nobody knows about it yet. So I flew down literally the next day. I looked around. I said, this is totally workable. My only priority was being able to open it for that season because, you know, when you when you invest that kind of money with furniture and everything, you want to, you know, you want to hit the summer. And we were able to open up at the end of June, so kind of halfway through the summer. And, um, and yeah, it was a really, another really fast project uh, that came together. But, you know, my in instincts were correct. Most of our clients from Dubai and from London are in Ibiza in the summer. So it's really, well, I think what gives me the most amount of pleasure and what makes the most sense is when you build a brand that people follow, you know, and that they trust, the nicest thing is to walk around your restaurants in every city and just see faces that you see from your restaurants in other cities. I mean, that's really the most, that's the biggest compliment anyone could ever give. How is it um, the the this idea of getting people to come to a restaurant more than once a week, right? I mean, that's are you giving them discount? Do they have priorities? Do they just call in and say, "I want my table"? Um, because that's that's rare, right? I mean, that's a, there's a big there's a that's a long uh, that's a good question and it's a long answer. So the first part I would say is about recognition. People want to feel recognized, so we have a very very strong um, system in place where we profile our guests. We know where they like to sit, who do they like to be served by, what's their favorite bottle of wine, you know, what's the name of their wife, what's the name of their kids, um, and and really understanding what are their preferences, I would say. Um, you know, there's this amazing book by Danny Myers uh, called Setting the Table. And it's really a Bible in the, in the restaurant business. If anyone's interested in opening a restaurant, they should read that book. And in that book, he talks about something called Connecting the Dots. And dots are these small pieces of information that you can collect from your guests to create a profile about them because recognition of their preferences, of, of their likes, their dislikes, is the number one way to loyalize anybody. You know, when people feel they're appreciated, they're recognized, and so on. The second thing I would say is value. Value is one of these things that when you're, you're giving a sense of value, people feel like they're getting bang for their buck. They feel like, you know, they they feel like you know, they're not being ripped off. I think is the, is the number one way you could create an experience that people want to come back for. It's reliable, it's dependable, you know what you're getting, and you know that you're always going to have 
good value for your money. Um, number three, I would say it's really about experience. I mean, experience, ambiance, warmth, friendliness, uh, a sense of familiarity, a sense of authenticity, again, is what resonates with people. And I would say also a little bit of celebration. You got to throw in a dash of celebration in there so that people feel that it's the place where they come to celebrate birthdays, you, uh, anniversaries, even just celebrating whether you, you know, survived a week at work. I mean, a place where people feel like they can let off some steam. Um, I think those are four, probably, I could probably think of more, but these are four key ingredients, I would say, uh, that go into getting people to come back to your restaurant. Two more questions. Um the concept of Chef Gordon Ramsay uh, or the Salt Bay, right? Celebrity driven. Um, the Salt Bay is pretty much everywhere. 50 million Instagram followers because he does the little sprinkled sauce, uh, which is amazing. I mean, everyone takes pictures. It's almost like invented a, a celebrity. I mean, who would have thought someone serving you, um, you know, food and go, wow, you know what I mean? It just really remarkable if you take a look at it. And then you have Chef Gordon Ramsay who was everywhere, TV and all that. And then his restaurants weren't doing as well and then somehow made a comeback. And now there seems to be a lot more restaurants everywhere. So as an outsider, how do you evaluate both of these uh, entrepreneurs per se and what makes them special? I mean, they're both trailblazers, to be honest with you. I mean, I think uh, uh, the chef from Nusret changed the game. I mean, I think he was the first Instagram viral chef, you know, and his character, his costume, his, you know, his thing with the, with the salt, mm -hmm. it really became instantly recognizable at a time when nobody had really capitalized on this new medium of Instagram. And I would say, you know, he really understood the game and he really rode that wave. Now, whether, you know, that's a, that's a, going to go on for longer or whether, you know, uh, that is something that people will always be interested in. I don't know that remains to be seen, but, I uh, I think he was really very smart about his execution. He understood the 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 amazing potential of Instagram, and he understood uh, this new kind of world that we were living in, which was the idea that people wanted to go and and catch a glimpse of this of this guy, this character, this kind of like crazy butcher guy. Um, Gordon Ramsay has is a, is a media empire. You know, he is, he is, I mean, I don't know how many books and, and, and TV shows and, and that he's done, but I think probably what he has realized is it's a lot more difficult to manage a restaurant or to create a restaurant than it is to, you know, be on TV and to, to be this kind of TV personality. I mean, having restaurants as a business, if you're not present or you don't have a team that you trust that is present, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's a, which brings me to my last questions. After opening up many restaurants, some have failed earlier on, and obviously now you're riding the streak of, of success and fire and built a great brand with the main. What do you think the key to success is? If you can give us a very sort of a elaborate answer, not you know work hard and be persistent. We all know that, but if you break down, what do you break the essence of success? Wow, it's a really good question. I think the essence of success is about having your finger on the pulse of what is happening and being able to adapt. I think really adaptability is one of the most, the key things. I mean, yes, you need to have a formula. The formula needs to work. You need to understand you know, you, you need to always keep the main thing, the main thing, you know, have these pillars that are kind of the foundations of your business. But at the same time, as a sort of a top layer, you always need to be adapting. You need to be kind of moving a little bit and uh, with the crowds, with the changing tastes, changing perceptions. Um, I, I, I would say adaptability is one of the key recipes to success. Well, it's um, two Montreal guys. Um two great success stories, but more importantly in a, you know, everybody wants to be a restaurant guy um, or has the idea they think they'd be a good restaurant guy, but like any other business, it's not easy, but the fundamentals are the same. I think the attention to details, the wow experience, sure. looking at what your competition is doing, constantly re-innovating um, and 
more importantly, um, is the word wow, right? I mean, if people don't come back and don't tell others unless they're wowed. Hundred percent. The main, every single main that you'll go to doesn't look the same as the other. There's there's similarities. There's foundations that you can reckon. You know when you're at a main, but actually, that's what I meant by adaptability. Also, is is that they all are designed to suit the neighborhood that they're in. They're designed to really kind of um, have a sense of place, and that's kind of very important. Also, well, the the irony is, I sent you. I was in Sydney, Australia, inside a hotel. And I went to a restaurant, which was also a brasserie, and it had a little bit of the same feel as as yours, but the food just wasn't good. And it was like one of those menus where you looked at it, and I didn't know what anything was, you know, carrot puree with butterscotch. And I'm like, the fuck is I just want a steak. And then, you know, it was it was very disappointed. Like you look at the menu, and they're like, ah, there's nothing to eat. Uh, even the appetizers of your your two slices of tomatoes with olive oil, the presentation and the freshness, and that was really good. I had two of those. Um, Simplicity, honesty, uh, and I would say honestly, just giving food that people want to eat, but doing it right. You know, even if it's a classic, do it right. And if you're gonna add a twist, make it so faint that it adds value. It doesn't take away value. Well, I, I would recommend everyone to go visit any of those restaurants, but more importantly, also maybe take a look at the Instagram, take a look at the pictures so you can truly understand. And and this is not just about owning a restaurant business. You know, conceptual implementation is taking the ideas that Joey has brought up in the restaurant. How does it apply into your business, into your sphere, into your experience with your customers? It's not just saying, well, I'm not in the restaurant. I think that's a mistake. I think you've taken a lot of things from other places and implemented into your restaurants. Is that correct? What do you think is the biggest thing not part of the restaurant that you've brought into your restaurant? I mean, like I said, I mean, I've, I've, I've been traveling and dining and I've always, I've, I will always observe, you know, why it works and why it evokes in me a feeling a good feeling, why I feel comfortable, or why I feel, you know, glamorous, or why I feel, you know, warm, why I feel um, recognized. I mean, I take, I, I analyze why it works, what they're doing to make me feel that way. And I, and I take those learnings and I try to adapt it into, uh, you know, into our own, uh, into our own business. And I think that is the best thing you could do is be a great observer. I'm, I'm going to ask you a, a question just out of curiosity. If you had the choice right now to your next location, is it in France? Is it in Singapore? Or is it in Australia? Why? Pick the country and order all three of them and why? Uh, it wouldn't be any of those places. It would be, I would probably, what we built in London is really a one of a kind. Why, why not Paris? Just out of curiosity, right? They're just um, labor laws, complicated market. Uh, it's dominated very much by one restaurant group over there uh, who's doing a great job. Um, and it's not as interesting uh, as really uh, not the right place for what for what we built. What about, um, Sing what about Singapore? Singapore is more interesting. I think Singapore because uh, I think they're lacking that it's 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 very brand name-ish, but it, it's lacking that. Um... So, I mean, look, what what we've ended up with in this journey the, the, that has now been eight years is I've kind of ended up with three different types of mains, three verticals of mains. Um, I have the typical premium casual vertical, which is the one that you came and dined at, which is really could, could go into any sort of, uh, I'd say, B city with a 1.5 to 2.5 million population, which is your kind of classic, dependable, reliable, comfortable brasserie experience, where you don't mind spending 20% more because you know you're getting great value and experience and ambience. The Mayfair model is not that. The Mayfair model is much more about entertainment. It's live music every night. It's a show. It's where you go to impress. And that type of uh, concept really is more suited to a Miami or a Vegas um, or Nashville in a way. I mean, if you take a look at Nashville being, you know, being a lot of conventions there, but also those streets are so packed all the time. Ironically, there's an area in Nashville where you have this, this area called the Gulch, right, which is becoming a very high end kind of restaurant places. And then you have your Broadway and second, which is your country bars after country bars, all celebrity branded, but packed all the time. It's, it's insane the, in a very small area. Very interesting. Right. Well, the demographics are changing. I think, um, you know, again, 
in Dubai, we had opened our locations in these kind of predominantly